Can y'all hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. I see a lot of the new uh, CLA shirts people have worn today, so it's great to be back for day two. And we had some great discussions yesterday and look forward to them today as well. Um, I'm going to be reviewing the MS Software Roadmap. We're going to have a few different people up on stage here uh, going into a little bit more detail on some of the uh, workflows we're working on in NXG, LabVIEW NXG right now. Um, just want to conclude that we've got a good contingency of folks here. One second. And I'll have this slide up on the end too, just so you can note who uh, you might want to follow up with afterwards today. But uh, I want to call out Amin is here today as well. He spoke during some of the sessions yesterday um, to gather some of your feedback on this roadmap, uh, as well as a, a good uh, group of our product owners, uh, which is a role that uh, if you were in the NI session yesterday, we spoke about. But uh, uh, considering some of the key workflows that you guys are looking at around um, these areas here. So some of these folks will join me on stage to walk through the workflows and um, roadmap sections, and then the other uh, attendees here, last on the list is myself, Deb Berg. Okay, uh, so looking through kind of the summary of the roadmap here, uh, we've been wanting to look at mapping the feedback that we've gathered from y'all, um, you know, at summits like these, via the forums, um, and our conversations with you. Uh, these are not in any particular order on this list, but these are some of the uh, key topics that we've heard bubble up, and then uh, within both LabVIEW and LabVIEW NXG, uh, we're starting to, how we're starting to address those. So some of them, in LabVIEW 2017, for example, the backwards compatible runtime engine, I'm starting to build that capability in, which I'll talk about more detail here in a second, and LabVIEW 2017 SP1, um, basically Stephen's presentation yesterday on the enhanced capabilities within malleable VIs uh, for covering uh, classes. And then a lot of the other features I'll talk about here for LabVIEW 2018, uh, some of the, uh, uh, I guess, incremental improvements we're making in these areas as well as in LabVIEW NXG. So um, if you have particular questions on these, sit tight, hopefully I'll address them. Otherwise, uh, we can circle back in the end of the uh, LabVIEW section. Okay, and then I uh, just want to reinforce that with LabVIEW NXG 1.0 released last year, LabVIEW NXG 2.0 released last month, uh, starting to address a few more of the automated test and measurement applications. So 1.0 was particularly focused at desktop, DAC, uh, kind of benchtop measurements, automating those, and now we're feeding in a lot more of the PXI platform vision capabilities in 2.0, and these are going to be concurrent releases now moving forward with LabVIEW 2018 coming out in a nine week, as well as another release of LabVIEW NXG. Okay, so let's jump into LabVIEW 2018 features. Just want to highlight here that the developers wanted me to mention that we are definitely looking for uh, beta feedback on some of these features, and I'll call out a few, a few of them specifically, uh, but if, if you have used some of these features or if any of these catch your eye, please uh, flag us down because we want to be sure and follow up with you. So the first one, uh, which we have talked about uh, at previous events, previous NI weeks, is the ability to create packages within LabVIEW as a build specification option. <coughs> Previously, this was a specific capability you had to install using the NI Package Manager, but with LabVIEW 2018, it will be one of the build specifications that ships here. So from this, you can um, add in your applications into a package and then build that and it will be something you can manage through the NI Package Manager. Uh, also wanted to highlight there are command line interface tools uh, for building these packages with LabVIEW as well. So what that looks like on your Windows machine, uh, you have a variety of both NI products as well as your own that you can manage with uh, NI Package Manager. Otherwise, in System Link, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which is our uh, web-based uh, software management system for both uh, Windows PCs as well as uh, we're starting to phase in more NI Linux real-time targets. Uh, you can uh, manage your software uh, on remote deployed systems. So with that, uh, you can have set up repositories uh, with your NI packages as well as your application packages and manage you know, what versions are on each of those targets, uh, set them up uh, to also uh, you know, make sure you're monitoring the tests on those systems and uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail as to what's coming on that roadmap, which we're also excited in. Uh, just to clarify, the packages are not equivalent to uh, the IPM packages, right? Correct. Okay. 
packages. Yeah, but like if you want to do something akin to the other package uh, manager, where you would have and have it and documentation and that type of deployment, you would still be using the other package manager for that. Correct, yes, still use VI Package Manager. Uh, we are going to go into a little bit more detail on the cap capabilities that are coming with NI Package Manager. Uh, but yeah, for, for most of your existing systems, deployments, managing documentation, continue to use VI Package Manager. Okay, uh, another key feature coming in 2018 is improvements to VI Analyzer. So via the VI Analyzer enthusiast community, as well as a lot of our internal uh, system engineering teams that have been using it, uh, we've fed in a lot more features than I listed here, but I want to call out a couple tests. Uh, one is valid control type, so if you have a, if you don't want to use just a custom control, but you want to mandate that we're using type definitions, you can set up a test for that. Also, if you are uh, against auto error handling, there might be just a couple of y'all in this room, uh, you can also set up a test to fail if uh, auto error handling has been enabled, uh, as well as the... <laughs> And then, uh, as well as the uh, configuration file, if you are setting up uh, custom tests or just want to save uh, what tests you are working on between projects and, and load those up, uh, that's now an XML-based human readable file. <laughs> so that should uh, save, save you some time and some of your workflows there uh, for diffing, understanding what changes have been made on the, those tests specifically. So one, just want to put up a quiz here on uh, one of the new tests, which is looking at uh, for loop error handling making sure that's been done correctly. Which of these loops out of these nine, there's more than one, have correct error handling? Just a quiz. B, E, and H. Okay, I'm hearing a few of them. Just want to highlight also letter E um, on parallel for loops. Uh, we now have an error register, new type of tunnel on there uh, that makes sure we capture all of the errors coming through in your various iterations, and then you, know, you can merge them and handle them separately at the end. But five, four. Three, two. Use three in the middle. <laughs> have correct error handling. But that is one of the new VI analyzer tests uh, that you can set up to make sure that you are doing this correctly. Okay, I mentioned this before, but the backwards compatible LabVIEW runtime engine. So uh, this was first built in starting with LabVIEW 2017. So as you built your uh, PPLs, applications, DLLs with uh, LabVIEW 2017, now in LabVIEW 2018, you can start to reap the benefits where if you upgrade, you don't necessarily need to uh, you know, update those validated uh, PPLs, for example, that you built in LabVIEW 2017. They were still run on your 2018 runtime engine, so you can update that and, and continue to use those same binaries. This also applies on LabVIEW real-time targets, so you can still only have one version of the runtime engine on a real-time target at once, uh, but the, the same um, uh, method applies here too, where you can load a 2017 binary. Okay, uh, another new feature that we're excited about and are looking for feedback and beta users is the Python node. So similar to the call library function node, uh, we, are, we have a specific palette for Python uh, calling a, a Python script. So here uh, you can see the, the palette that's up here and there's I think five or six different shipping examples too, going through different examples. Um, but this uh, does call up a, a different process to manage. Uh, so say if you're doing multiple different calls at once, it would call a different process to load the Python, uh, to load the script you're working on. To, se to separate the nthought Python toolkit uh, that we talked about the last couple of years, this is more natively uh, integrated, it's included in base LabVIEW, um, and if you are interested in this, we can go into some of the more uh, details. Fortunately, it's not supported on RT uh, yet. Is that your question? <coughs> yeah, it's not supported on RT yet, uh, but that is uh, in the roadmap, but you can still, on Linux real-time targets, you can still uh, still install Python on your real-time targets and, and load up scripts, but just not using uh, the node yet. Okay, how many of you guys are, are using a system where you need to integrate Python? I've been asking you. Right, another area we, where we're investing is in uh, Python drivers as well. Um, I don't have the details on, on that roadmap, um, but if you are interested, I can connect you with the right folks. Okay, another one, uh, I know that you guys have been asking for this for a while, thank you James for maintaining uh, the existing command line interface. So LIBA 2018 uh, will have an officially supported command line interface. Um, it has the 
got commands that are listed here. So basically, if LabVIEW isn't open, it will it will open up LabVIEW, make these make whatever calls that you have set, or if it's already open, it will uh, load an instance where you can uh, run a VI, uh, call a VI, mass compile, run uh, VI analyzer, run unit testing, run um, VI package manager commands here as well. So there's a kind of a full list of what's capable here as well as <laughs> steer, standard error handling. Uh, so we're definitely this is something we want to deliver to you guys and continue to get feedback on because we know it's been a a gap that we uh, have had for the last few years. So um, <clears throat> if you have additional feedback here, we're going to beta test it out, please talk to me afterwards and we can make sure you get you the right tools. Okay. The malleable VR functionality, this was basically Stephen's presentation yesterday, so I won't go ad nauseum here, um, but this was one of the features that we put into 2017 SP1, uh, which I know is rare for us to do, but just wanted to continue to call that out. Okay, uh, so that's a, a summary of some of the LabVIEW 2018 features. Um, for LabVIEW 2019, uh, right now we are going under the um, prioritization process, so if there are additional things that you didn't see here, uh, please talk to myself and uh, Eric. I'm going to throw your hand up in the back. Eric Ruffett, uh, who is uh, managing the LabVIEW 2019 uh, prioritization schedule right now. So um, continue to hear your feedback there. Uh, now to move it towards LabVIEW and XG and in our investments here. So the 2.0 released last month, uh, January 23rd. Uh, so the focus here, as I mentioned before, is to continue to add in additional capability for building test and measurement systems, Windows-based test and measurement systems. So some of the features, I guess I'll maybe jump ahead a slide. Uh, this is the kind of core feature list, but things like System Designer, uh, which we've been showing for a while, is now released in the product. Um, initial integration, <coughs> with uh, test stand, so ability to call LabVIEW VI from test stand. Uh, application builder, this is the first release. The LabVIEW NXG web module uh, was also released last month, which we'll go into more detail here in a second. Um, additional hardware support, so a lot of the PXI platform, vision systems, uh, as well as the LabVIEW communications uh, targets, such as um, the software-defined radios, those will continue to be supported there. And then um, from a software engineering perspective, the compare tool was included in this release. So um, in tomorrow's software test lab, uh, you can check out the next version, which we'll be uh, demoing, which is uh, the 2.1 beta, which has been on the tech preview community uh, now for a couple months, uh, which will be kind of the next release after, um, which we'll be targeting in a few months here. And then also, I forgot I have this slide here. I wanted to show the, the hardware support. So again, it's a, a, a decent amount of the PXI platform is released and supported in LabVIEW and XG today. Okay, saw a couple of people taking a picture. So looking at the next release, um, we are trying to prioritize not just broad-based features, but making sure we are delivering on some of the, the workflows that you guys are interested in as well. Um, not just around setting up an initial system, you know, making sure that you have uh, all the right software installed using an iPackage manager, but also we are focusing on the deployment experience. So getting you know, your bits from your de development machine to a deployed production test system. So we released Application Builder last month. Now we're focusing on taking those applications, uh, creating efficient package-based installers um, so that you can uh, have smaller installers that you're putting on the machine that can go point to the uh -huh. ones where that software is, is uh, saved and, and go ahead and install it. So you don't have to have multi-gig installers that you're carting around to those systems, but we can be smarter in that approach. So that's the, the deployment uh, top priority that we're focusing on in the next release. Also team-based development, so uh, making improvements to the diff tool. Um, project dependency management is an area that we're going to uh, be looking for your feedback at the software test lab tomorrow. We are in kind of prototype paper mode right now, um, understanding how you manage your dependencies today uh, and then you know how we can improve that uh, in LabVIEW and XG as well. Um, system link and, and uh, the LabVIEW and XG web module are the other top priorities that we're working on now that you can make use of today. So you have your LabVIEW system. You don't need to touch any of the uh, logic or you know core capabilities that's running on that machine, but you can refresh the UI using LabVIEW and XG. So you can uh, build the new UI and use the same you know uh, TCP IP or network commands uh, to communicate with your existing system. So. Um, I'll leave some of that to, to Mark here in a second to give more detail on, on what that is, but that's something that uh, you know we want you to be able to use LabVIEW NXG 
without having to migrate all of your code for an existing system, but be able to re refresh the UI uh, on a standalone. Yep. Uh, maybe I missed something, but what about the subpanels? Because I cannot use uh, yeah, an XG in the last project uh, without any subpanels. Yep, so that, that's a great question. The question was, what about where are the subpanels? Give me the subpanels. Uh, so that is one area that uh, we are considering uh, looking at cell panels right now, so we want to hear about how you use them so far as uh, within a, a static, uh, do you statically call them, do you dynamically call them, that is something that we are looking into. But the, the key takeaway that I want you guys to have is we are uh, pivoting away from, I mean we are focusing on HTML based uh, controls. So we want to uh, put a, a, we are doing a lot of our investment there uh, so that we can hopefully provide a, a a replacement for it that is not just uh, usable on Windows, but is cross-platform there. So we want to continue to hear how you're using subpanels. We're looking into possibly, you know, look, providing them within LiveView and XG, but we want to be sure that it would capture all of your use cases for dynamically calling them. So let's talk about it. Mark? On the list where it says UI composition, that's just another way of saying subpanels. More of a general way of saying subpanels. Yep. And then also if there are other you know, quote, deal breaker features that, you know, I need to see sub panels or I need to see that capability uh, before, you know, I want to use Live UMXG, continue to let us know and let's talk about it. Great, and then some of the items that are called out as secondary. Uh, we are making incre incremental um, progress and we're working on features in these areas, so um, calling.net is one that we're uh, looking at in the, the near term roadmap. Um, continue to make graphical diff improvements and, and debugging. Keep, uh, debugging enhancements. So some of those where we don't feel like you know we've necessarily satisfied all the use cases yet, but that's where we're starting to ch chip away in the next release. And then the areas that um, you know are, are areas that we are not choosing to prioritize in for this next release, but you know we will get to in the, the next few years that we want to you know focus on the broad base. A lot of our KXI users um, can build test systems uh, without necessarily needing uh, all of the functionality that's listed here. So these are areas like graphical merge, for example. We're doing research as to how we can look at uh, auto merge as kind of a, a first step in this direction before needing to go all the way to graphical merge. So that right now is a deferred. Um, perfect UI migration, that's not something that we're focusing on right now uh, because we want to look at the HTML-based controls uh, as a <clears throat> better replacement, more sustainable replacement there. And then, um, Quickly ramp up onboard new test engineers um, that is specifically calling out custom workbooks, which is something you guys may have seen us um, talk about before. Um, that's something where it's not a priority right now, but uh, we want to continue to get your feedback in that area. And then uh, to call out uh, some of the capabilities that uh, we're looking to have partners invest in. So a UML editor, uh, that's something that uh, VI Technologies has been working on and we'll have a beta available for you guys to test out at the um, software lab tomorrow morning, uh, Thursday morning as well as SVN integration. So Viewpoint uh, has been working on a .NET extension for SVN integration as well, which we'll have a beta to try out tomorrow morning. And then uh, UML testing, is, or excuse me, unit testing is another area where we know we have a lot of um, solutions out there on the tools network today, and we want to continue to have that uh, be capability that's uh, managed uh, by partners. <coughs> So this is the uh, roadmap that we have on ni.com. I know it's it's kind of small test text, but if you go to um, ni.com slash labview, I mean, it is in that, that area of the website where you can see in more detail. But this is where we are you know, publicly wanting to stake our claim as to where we are investing next in the product and uh, where we will get you know future releases to. <coughs> Any initial questions? Yep, the question is, what about certain toolkits within LabVIEW? Where's the roadmap there? Uh, so some of them, we, we definitely took a step back and realized you know, we have a lot of toolkits. Some of them, we want the functionality to just be core in LabVIEW, or you know, similar functionality to just be core in LabVIEW. Um, and then some of them you know, are going to continue to be separate toolkits. So the web module is a new tool, new module that we released. Um, LabVIEW FPGA uh, is going to be one that's going to be fast following here um, in a, a coming release for Flex Rio targets. A lot of your real time will be down the way. Um, but we're looking at it specifically from, you know, is this enough functionality or new deployment target that should be, you know, continue to be its own module? 
Uh, and then a lot of the smaller ones were probably going to be you know, rolling into the product as, as much as possible. Was there a specific one that came to mind? Yeah, and I vision toolkit. Yep. So I know um, the VBay, the, the, the um, uh, yeah, the Vision Builder. That one already has support for Live One XG. Um, I don't believe right now we have plans for a specific vision module, but there is support for that hardware within Live So um, I can I can follow up with you after that uh, for vision specifically. Okay. And then uh, to mention the Live Tools Network, so uh, we are working with some initial key partners like JKI, uh, MGI, uh, Safier on releasing both free and paid toolkits uh, to kind of test out that workflow. Uh, but we will be looking to have a Live One XG Tools Network uh, at some point after NIW 2018. We want to make sure that the workflows and product are um, polished and, and good for y'all before we kind of do the broad. There we go. Uh, before we do the broad uh, release where we want to onboard uh, you know, the whole swath of toolkits and, and make sure we're migrating those over. So right now we continue to look at the, the ones that are um, on the MI package manager today. We'll be adding a few more as well as uh, .NET extensions like the UML editor and SVN like I mentioned. And if this is something where you're interested in uh, trying out the beta functionality that's there now, uh, please come talk to myself and uh, Bob DeRosier. And we'll uh, get you started uh, with the tools that are there right now. Okay, uh, any questions, any last questions on uh, Live UNXG? Okay, again, we've got, um, I'll have a slide up at the end with each of the R&D members on their area of focus because we definitely want to talk with you guys in more detail uh, after the session during the next break and during the rest of the conference. Okay, thanks, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so uh, to start us off, uh, I'm going to be talking about the web module, what it currently has, and also a little bit of roadmap. But uh, to, to kind of set the stage, the web module is kind of like LabVIEW RT and LabVIEW FPGA. It's an add-on module to LabVIEW, and as such, it is purchased separately. So you guys all heard it directly from me. So when we look at, uh, yeah, I'll take the clues. We look at applications in engineering where uh, web UIs are applicable. We, we generally uh, put them in these four categories. And now there's a lot of overlap between each of these categories. But right now, the web VI is, is best suited for uh, real-time monitoring. And things like remote configuration is a little bit more in the, in the wheelhouse of things like system link. But as we add capability to the web module, we're going to be able to do more of these applications. So the web module is more than just web VIs. Because web VIs on their own isn't quite enough to compose a full application. So the web module includes these three kind of main components. Of course, it includes web VIs, sort of the, the, the keystone part of this. Uh, it also includes data services, which are a nice abstraction on HTTP. It's the same data services we're using with our system wing product. And they're really, really, really nice to use in order to simplify communication both from distributed systems all the way up to the web browser. And finally, we include a web server so that you can host your web applications on premises if you so chose. So a little bit more details about the web VIs. Uh, assuming a, a lot of you folks have heard about them, but the web VIs are a new type of VI, and what's special about them is that their front panel and their block diagram both run in the web browser. So you're able to do client-side logic in a web browser, which is something new that we haven't been able to do before. Uh, so other nice things about uh, the web VI uh, is they're very engineering focused. You do not find the types of controls just in the ecosystem today that can uh, be used for engineering applications, depending on how uh, data is formatted, uh, uh, you know, being able to do things like uh, octal presentation or logarithmic scales, uh, exponential notation, and so on. And also, we're really focused on trying to make the web VIs open. You can edit the HTML that we generate as you build the web VI in NXG. When you build the web VI, the output of it is just a flat list of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. It's the same types of files that you would find anywhere. And that's why 
we can say that you don't need a plugin in order to be able to run a web VI because at the end of the day, a, a web VI is more or less indistinguishable from any other web application that uh, you use uh, in a web browser. So uh, inside uh, the web module, uh, we generally see architectures that we'd like to set up like this, where we have devices, edge nodes at the bottom, uh, you might have a centralized server in the middle, and then you have clients, which can be a variety of shapes and sizes, because web browsers show up just about anywhere. <coughs> you can uh, bypass uh, what's, what's shown on the right if we wanted to talk directly to web services on uh, say in our T-target, we have some examples on GitHub that demonstrate this. We're increasingly wanting people to utilize our data services and go through a centralized server because it's a more scalable and a more secure pattern. And so a little bit of what these uh, data services look like, so we'd have edge nodes, which is things like desktop PCs or RT targets uh, or PXI systems that uh, could be running LabVIEW, uh, LabVIEW RT, or LabVIEW and XG, and these things are, are producing data, or maybe there's some uh, basic command and control going on, and that's going through a central server and allowing us to be able to uh, uh, bring that data into a web BI with the, the same APIs, or actually the exact same APIs, the same interface, both uh, 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 for LabVIEW and for web BIs. Uh, and of course, uh, we also have uh, a new func some new functionality that is shipping with System Link for being able to build just-in-time dashboards. And we'll see a little bit more of that in the web module going forward. This guy animates, I did not know that. Um, so one of the important things, uh, and the reason we include a web server has to do with deployment. So when you take a web VI, its source is uh, a VI, right? It is not, its source is not HTML. But when you build it, the output that you get, as I mentioned earlier, is HTML. You can then take that and put that on an on-premises server, and we ship you one with the web module to make sure that you have one. This server is based on Apache. It includes some really, really nice configuration tools to be able to set it up and secure it appropriately. And of course, once it's on a web server, uh, you just go to that URL in your browser and you're able to view your web application. Now, what if you don't want to manage a server? So one of the things that we're looking into uh, a lot right now, and we're actually hoping to have a beta available in the next month or two, is cloud services. So one of those services is Web BI hosting. If you're able to host a Web BI on-premises and that works for your solution, that's really great. But if you need to be able to view data from anywhere, the cloud is really the best option because it's, it's highly accessible. And additionally, uh, we are going to be making available with this cloud services uh, the dashboard editor. This is the same dashboard editor that we're shipping with System Link. So you're going to be able to build just-in-time visualizations for your engineering data all in a web browser. Beta is coming soon. And one other thing to mention, you know, it's not just Web BI hosting. We're actually hosting the same data services that I mentioned earlier. And those data services being cloud hosted is really nice because we can route that data to anywhere in the world. And that's really, really, really important for scalable applications. And this will all be based on your NI.com account. So if you guys don't have an NI.com account, I encourage you to get it. Join the tech preview, and you can play with our beta. <coughs> some other uh, feature investments, some key language features that we do not yet have in the web APIs are under development, the event structure. I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of that. Property nodes, definitely something that's a big gap right now. And uh, block diagram debugging. And the initial stuff that we're going to be doing with block diagram debugging will be tools to be able to do console out. And another investment is uh, tooling to be able to do uh, integrate with third-party IP. The ecosystem of the web is massive. It is the largest ecosystem on the entire planet. There is an immense number of highly valuable libraries in the wild, in addition to a really, really great collection of APIs that are available in the browser. When you hear like things like HTML5, in large part, that was additional browsers to enhance the capability of applications that can be built. So what we want to create is a standard interface to be able to call in to native code of the browser, which means JavaScript. This is going to enable things like, I mentioned console debugging, but also things like 3D uh, visualizations this is a, a library called 3JS that you're seeing here, and uh, we are calling directly into it from the block diagram. We're hoping that we can stoke the ecosystem with this and greatly enhance the capability because we, uh, although we're investing a lot in WebVI, 
there's just too many things that a web browser can do that one uh, team can build on their own. And we want to encourage the community to help enhance that. Another big thing for the web is responsive layouts. Uh, this was made mainstream with uh, technologies like Bootstrap. Uh, and of course, we cycle through this and move from a desktop to a tablet to a phone. Now, I want to stress the fact that as we uh, engage in this activity, this is the most radical change to the LabVIEW front panel that we've ever attempted. And you know, we, we took out the front panel, we brought it into WPF, we brought it into HTML, but in still large parts the same front panel that we all know and love for a very long time. And being able to do things like relative layout and responsive layout and get the experience right for building it where you don't want to pull your hair out is very challenging, but it's very powerful if we can pull it off. Thank you. Any questions really quick? Question. Yeah. Um, how can we test the web VIs? Or, uh, for example, uh, I think it's, um, I have a uh, project where we use the video projector all the stuff to uh, touch the buttons on the web uh, because we have to test it. Mm -hmm. We have to verify. And we are talking about new tests and all the stuff. So is there an uh, out of the box uh, thing? So we can assess this web VI to test. So out of the box, I'm going to just say no, because I think that's, that implies something that I don't want to uh, necessarily say that we can do. But things, tools like Selenium would work with the Web BI. Because at the end of the day, the Web BI is just uh, a normal web application. Selenium is all based on CSS selectors in order to be able to find things and you can click on them. Uh, you can do all of that with the Web BI. I'd actually like to talk to you more uh, about that offline if I could, because it's something that we've only really started scratching the surface on. Yeah, so if the web VI is run in the uh, client, on the client side, doesn't that mean that all the IP is exposed, including passwords and such? Yeah, and actually, uh, so your IP has been compiled into a format called VIA. It's, uh, it stands for VI Assembly. You could go and read through that, and if you knew how to interpret that, you maybe could discover the IP of it. I'd say your your IP in a web VI is probably about the same at risk as the IP for any website in JavaScript. Uh, you know, we do things like minifying it and obfuscate it, but you can unminify that and uh, do that as part of kind of one of the things you take on when you opt into using the web. There's a second part of your question too. But I don't think I got to you. What else was that? Well, I think if you make a web VI, for instance, that interface with the database, then very, very easy to get that query or passwords. Right. Yeah, yeah, so passwords is definitely uh, a challenging thing. We're thinking about this a lot, and we haven't settled completely on our approach. But one of, one of the reasons we're building this cloud service is actually to help mitigate that. And also, one of the reasons we ship the same web server that we ship the system, like the same data services. So while when you're in development in LabVIEW, in your block diagram, you might have to include a username and password or an API key to authenticate that web VI with the data service that you're communicating with. But when you host it in our web browser or when you host it in our cloud service, the fact that it, you as a human are logging in uh, into that, we establish cookies uh, to store your credentials in a secure way. And all of the security is done to that mechanism. So in your final production application, you shouldn't actually need to include your uh, credentials unless you are self-hosting that on a web server of your own choosing, whether that be an on-premises web server that's not the NI web server, or uh, another cloud uh, service like S3 or Azure. Yeah. I think in a perfect world, you want some things to be server-side Right. We have that ability. This adds to the client that for the things you want to do in the client, we've never been able to do them. Right, and that's actually an important point is this, this concept of reverse proxying where you have a web service that's on a secure server and the credentials are being stored there rather than in the client you're sort of tunneling through. Question the back. Yeah, so uh, we are building on top of Amazon Web Services. Because everyone is, because they're eating the world. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you.
Uh, so before I turn it over to Sameda to talk a little bit about sharing source and binaries, uh, I wanted to come and talk a little bit about package management and I, kind of our current state. Um, as many of you have already heard many times, we're starting to standardize on packages as our software del de delivery mechanism. And this will also be what we end up recommending to you guys as well uh, in a future state. Specifically, we're talking about, to reference your question, NIPKG packages via NI Package Manager. Uh, you can see a screenshot there. If, you're, if you've already played around with Livion XG a little bit, you've probably used NI Package Manager to actually get it. Um, we actually are seeing a lot of other things going out in Package Manager now. So up, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we were testing in 2017 and consistently. There are hundreds and hundreds of instrument drivers already on there, as well as a few kind of handful of third-party add-ons. And talked a little bit about it earlier in the devs part of it, but we're starting to see presence in other development environments, so Live 2014 and, and later. And uh, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about Live Unix G as well. So the other thing we want to do is provide kind of a quick walkthrough of some of the kind of processes that you might be going through if you're deciding to, to go forward with this. So first things first, building your package, as I mentioned, LiveView 2014 and beyond, is going to provide the ability to, uh, or actually I should start with LiveView 2018 and 2014 and beyond, the ability to create packages directly from the IDE. And then creating a feed with packages, is anybody familiar with the feed concept already? Just a few of you, so basically a feed is essentially just a collection of packages and a manifest that describes what those packages are and the dependencies between them. Um, right now, currently, the way to create that is through an NFPM command line interface. Uh, we're working on basically other ways to be able to do that as well. It's a little bit more user friendly. Uh, on the other end of it, the client, people who are trying to consume your packages are going to register this feed through NFPM um, and then also go ahead and, and decide what they want to install and install it through NFPM. And then after that, the, the author of the packages can go forth and if they have a new version that they want to push out to their clients, they can update the package in a feed. The client will see the update in NIPM and they can choose to then uh, upload or update and install the new package. Yes? Does the update happen automatically or do they have to go find it? So it won't push the update onto the machine, but it'll push it to where they can see and they'll be notified about it. Yes? Um, so you think about integrating with what factory? With what, sorry? Artifactory. Is this um, proxy mirror that you use in the company when you don't have uh, direct access to the internet? To the I'm not sure what that is exactly, but we can talk about it offline. I'd like to learn more about it. So, last slide here, just what can you do to. Oh, sorry, is there another question over here? Yes. Is there a command line interface for the client side? There is, yes. So, basically, all these things can also be done from the command line. Like I mentioned, we're trying to figure out ways to put them into more friendly <coughs> workflows, either through NIPM, the GUI part, or through the products to be able to create packages and feeds. Um, so I'll talk actually a little bit about that here. So what can we do today? Like I mentioned, we can create packages through LabVIEW, through LabVIEW NXG, and through the command line. We can create and manage feeds through the command line interface and through System Link. Um, another, I want to plug here is something that my marketing counterpart, Alan Shu, has done, where he's effectively wrapped the NI API in in Lab UVIs um, and created a small application that you can do feed management on. Um, so if you want to get a hold of it, he would really appreciate some feedback on that and myself as well. As well as obviously register feeds and install packages through the GUI and through the command line as well. And that's all I have. So any questions? Yes? So that is something that we are evaluating and is on our backlog that is a gap that we realize we Uh, 
user environment? Like what, sorry? In Python, you can just run into a user environment without having open rights. Um, that's <coughs> another really consider it. Any other questions? So we talk about like you have your project and you want to make sure all the dependencies get onto the other people's project that you're sharing your code with as well as the machine that you're deploying the code on. And you could have reusable libraries, you can have drivers, you have IDE dependencies, you have runtime dependencies. And I was talking to people yesterday and it's like, oh, we have to remember all of these things. There's a wiki we point to. Sometimes we remember to update it, sometimes we don't. So I want to make those workflows more intuitive in an XG. And Specifically, I wanted to talk about managing project dependencies in your development workflow because this is something we're actively discussing, actively seeking feedback on. And uh, tomorrow in the test lab, I am going to have my computer. Well, you can come today and talk to me as well. We have, as Doug was mentioning, this is a paper product right now. Nothing is paper anymore, so it's yeah, paper like on wireframes. So please come talk to us, uh, me and Deb, and we want feedback on your user experience and what kind of capabilities would you like to see in this. We're planning to expose a package config document in an XG environment where you can see the list of your package dependencies. You should be able to go to those, fix your dependencies if they're not uh, up to date. And when you share your projects, you should be able to just see what is needed to get this project working on my system. Do we be able to do third party software on there? If it's a package. I believe you should be able to own, um, you should be able to create NI packages through command line. Yeah, you can create an NI package basically wrap almost anything. because I want to explore how would the document know that it needs that, like in the future. So we, we should explore that a little bit more. How automated versus manual is that workflow going to be? And we talked about deploying, uh, sharing on the development environment. This is something we're also looking into. It already exists in the uh, shipping product right now, but there is a mechanism to create installers, package-based installers, through the product today. Uh, we call it a distribution. And we are planning to expose more options in that area. Tomorrow at the test lab, you will see a script for that. So please do come give us feedback on that as well. Because I was talking to a bunch of you, and I know this is something that you mentioned like is a pain point right now sometimes to manage dependency. So I want to improve that. <coughs> Quickly wanted to mention compare tool. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about that as well in some of the sessions. We are looking at how can we improve compare tool. There is one that exists already, as Deb mentioned. There is going to be, uh, there, it is available with the beta as well. It's available with the, a version is available with the shipping connection uh, right now. So we are looking into, in the coming beta, exposing some project diff functionality as well as uh, some other functionality going forward. So we want feedback on that as well. Thanks, Al. Okay, I have a couple last slides to talk about uh, some of our other software products that are also based on um, our you know, original <coughs> technology stack. So, first one is System Link, uh, which has uh, been released. We had a 17.5 version that came out uh, last month along with the Lab USP, uh, Laboratory 17 SP1 release, so within System Link, and just a, a brief overview, uh, you can connect, deploy, and manage your test and measurement systems, Windows and uh, Analytics RT base, uh, to you know, <coughs> see some of the business benefit of understanding what version of software is installed in these machines, what is the current state, uh, and also being able to uh, see data uh, with the dashboarding capabilities uh, for those remote targets. So, Looking at uh, some of the roadmap areas here on the right, and I have a, a slide for each of them. So core capabilities in the product today, device management and software deployment, that's there, uh, that's ready to go. 
uh, some of the system performance management <coughs> we're making investments here uh, in the coming release uh, releases over 2018 so let me uh, jump to that as well as uh, something new that I'm interested in uh, getting some of y'all's feedback on today also uh, this catches your eye is sequence <coughs> monitoring so with the test stand deployment utility in 2017 you can build packages uh, which can also be uh, uh, absorbed I guess you can uh, in include your test stand packages, uh, manage them via system link, which also has some nice things where you can see uh, some of your test data, uh, step, uh, what step it's on, et cetera, and um, start to manage that. So within 2018, uh, health, man health management capabilities here, uh, not just seeing the current state of the target CPU usage, et cetera, but also being able to set alarms on some of these things, as well as uh, APIs for that too, so that you can bubble up uh, uh, sort of your own custom um, health, man health monitoring uh, statistics that you'd like to see uh, at this level. So that's important if you're managing, you know, tens, you know, five, ten, hundreds of targets. Uh, I've talked to a few of you that are managing large deployed systems that uh, this can be a, a game changer to understand uh, what's happening uh, with, the, with those systems. And then on the calibration management side, um, Cal data from NI systems, which is also an API here. We're trying to be very API first uh, with the system link uh, roadmap. And then um, you can see here, in the, I think this is just mock-up state right now, um, but also external calibration and dates on that. Uh, so that's, that's something you're interested in. I can uh, point you to the product manager for NI system link and be uh, wanting to get your feedback or even uh, get beta testing with you. And then uh, one of the new capabilities that we're exploring right now is test monitoring. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there's built integration with test stand uh, via packages there today. Uh, within this screenshot, it's just kind of uh, one-liners of uh, the last time the test system or the test was started, what does it's on right now, and the status. We're looking at some more, uh, you know, graphical ways that you might want to also see these tests uh, as they're coming in. If you're saving the test to a, a PDF or HTML report, you can also load the report uh, from this and download it uh, to see your results uh, remotely as well. Can you stop the execution? Right now it is just uh, test system monitoring. Uh, we have also <coughs> have a request to control or actually you know, be able to start some of those tests. Um, that, that's something the team is exploring, so I'll talk with you more offline. But this first release would just be monitoring. Lots of chatter, feel free to talk to me afterwards if there's questions. Uh, another uh, product that uh, and I. Would something like system link obviously security is going to be big? Is there any documentation online somewhere about how our security is? Uh, yep, the question is how, how can we learn more about um, system link's approach to securing authentication? Uh, maybe uh, linking in with your existing Windows Active Directory and LDAP. Um, that is all with the product documentation. That is one of the, the key concerns. We realize some customers might want to manage this with their internal server, or maybe have a you know a hierarchy of servers where one is internal and then that talks to one that, that's external um, across your fleet. But uh, yeah, that, that's all in the documentation. <coughs> okay, uh, next uh, product I want to give a brief overview about because I'm not sure if everyone has heard about this one is uh, NI Instrument Studio. Uh, so looking at the products that we have today for soft front panels, they're uh, you know, very disparate, there's different capabilities in each of them that you're working with. Um, we want to really um, bring forth a, a more premier soft front panel experience that base, that's based on our uh, next gen uh, editor, which you'll, you'll see here in a second. Um, has the same look and feel and is standard across many of our instruments. Uh, so when you're looking at you know, what, what step in my process am I going to need to use this front software panel? What about uh, new users? How are they going to be interacting with them? So looking at kind of this, this high-level workflow from start to finish of uh, deploying an automated test system, there's a few different stages where you might be using these software panels. So of course, you're getting the system set up, just taking some ad hoc measurements. Is my, um, you know, is my DMM set up correctly? Am I working with the do I have my channel set up correctly? So that's kind of step one. But also, as you're going through the de development process, you need to configure that measurement and uh, maybe take a few tests uh, as you're setting up a new class, for example. Maybe I need to you know, 
plug in a new instrument, add a new class, uh, let's test that out. Also, on the debugging side of things, we want this to be a useful tool here. Uh, so if you're uh, you know, looking at the system that's deployed, I just want to be able to walk up, quick plug in this software panel, and, and get some data back on what's happening on the system. So uh, looking at Instrument Studio, um, you know, next generation software panel, but this is uh, something that we can use today. Um, all the instruments, we'll be adding them in, facing them in over time. I think the next slide uh, have detail on which ones are out there now. Uh, so with Instrument Studio 2018, that'll be coming out. Uh, there's uh, support for a few of the instruments here. We'll be adding in more uh, RF device support uh, for the coming releases here too. Uh, but this is something where uh, our team has been getting a lot of feedback from new and existing users on. So this is uh, something that you uh, would like to use more prevalently uh, in your workflow or have specific feedback about any of the current software panel uh, products that we have today, please uh, come talk to me afterwards and I give you the contact information uh, for the product manager that's uh, leading this. Great, and then the last product I want to touch on is NIFLEX Logger. Oh. One question to the instrument studio. Uh, do I have to install it in the machine? Because when I'm on the customer side, I don't have a production machine, normally there is no environment or something installed. So it would be nice to have that portable, say, you plug in some USB uh, drive, start the instrument studio, get your data to look where the error is, for example, especially for debugging purposes, without having to install that new software there, because that's not normal in the process. Yep, that, that's a great question. I'm actually not sure um, what the runtime engine dependency is on this, um, but I'll follow up. Yeah. Okay, uh, so NI, NI Flex Logger, uh, this is a product that we have available in early release uh, right now. So looking at the breadth of data logging applications, obviously <coughs> NI has been doing data logging for a long time. You guys have been doing data logging for a long time. Um, there are better products out there. You can build a simple VI to do this. We wanted to take a hard look at what are some specific data logging applications that we can provide a, a turnkey product to address and address it well. So looking at um, the customer feedback or the customer insight that the team has been gathering on data logging applications, these are the kind of five key um, uh, applications that they've identified. And the first one that uh, this FlexLog product is gonna be going after is ad hoc data logging. So that's you know the technician needs to walk up, take some tests, maybe automate them quickly, get the results uh, to the design team. So that's the first one that uh, the product will be biting off uh, in ad hoc data logging. So these are some of the tasks that we want to be really crisp within this product to be able to do. So walk up, plug in your signals, verify the hardware setup correctly, uh, get that data quickly. So looking at the goals, we want to make sure that they are confident that the data they're gathering is correct, and then uh, be able to quickly execute and get those results to the uh, requester. So looking at an iFlex logger, again, it has the same look and feel, the same uh, environment that we have in, in Labio MXG and our other products. So focusing on results, some of the initial I.O. for ad hoc data logging. So I mentioned there's early access release, so 2018 R1. Um, if this is something you're interested in, uh, let me know. And uh, hook you up with uh, the right folks to get access to this. So it doesn't have, I mean, these are the measurements and hardware that are supported now. We'll be adding in more compact app functionality over time, as well as uh, improvements to the different graphs and UIs that are available there. And then um, the ultimate vision here is what's listed out for the kind of complete breadth of, of hardware that we do plan to support over time as we look at some of those other um, component data logging and uh, other uh, application areas that I mentioned. But again, ad hoc data logging is the first uh, approach, or uh, the first early release the application we're going after. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, do I need to talk to you? What was that? <coughs> Who do I need to talk to for this? For FlexLogger? For FlexLogger? Uh, his name is Joey Spinella, but I can uh, get you his information afterwards. Joey oh, is not here. He's not here today, unfortunately. <coughs> is any, anybody at that's here, have any uh, background in this one? Okay, John can give you some more details. Steve? Are all the graph and front panel uh, build and fill aspects of things like the flex over the 
smart studio. Are they then available in Latin? The use case I'm thinking of is you've got these things here that do 90 to 99% of what a customer wants. <coughs> and then I go, I need this extra 5%. And I can't recreate it because I can't use examples. There was a, there was a single express on it. Probably had a nice graph, nice sort of stretching thing on it. And you couldn't do it in that view very easily. <coughs> Whereas you've obviously done it in that view because it's written in but it wasn't, you didn't release the widgets to allow us to rebuild something that looked the same as, as it was. Um, so I just wondered if, if, if you bring out something like this flex logger, which at some point a customer will buy and want to extend, can we do that? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, in some of these more turnkey products, you know, there's nice UI, nice graphs on there. <laughs> How can I take those same exact graphs and extend them within my view? Like, I don't want to have to rebuild them from scratch, something along those lines. So um, I know that there's going to be APIs to extend with LabVIEW, um, or to extend FluxLogger with LabVIEW more on the logic side or execution side. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. I, I'm not sure so far as, hey, here's the FluxLogger graph kind of standard. How, how can I you know, replicate that or have a suite of, of those graphs as like a palette option, maybe something like that? Yeah, um, well, you, you end up, as, you know, as a supplier, you end up as a really stupid. <coughs> if you get a free thing and it's got all these widgets on it, it's like, well, you're the expert. And I have all these widgets, and you say, Yeah, well, that's going to cost you about four months of work it's for me to recreate these widgets that you can see in front of you with this freedom. So, I mean, you should make it really policy where if you are going to create a tool, then you need to spin out the widgets that are on the tool so that people can recreate that functionality. It should be as you go through it and just say, Well, this is IP, I have it. But it's just look and feel stuff, I don't care about any of that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, that's great feedback. I mean, did you have something? Yeah, I mean, part of, I just want to comment that is, that is the use case we're looking at. Part of the reason we're building a lot of our new software on the next gen stack is so that we can get reused across the products, inclusive of Latin. So, yeah, we've put a lot of interesting features in the graphs here. Um, there's some really interesting capabilities in this studio. Um, and we'll be working to put those in Latin as they make sense. So the question or the um, request is, can I create my own software and panels and kind of integrate with those in the Instrument Studio? Um, I do not know enough about the roadmap to comment on that. Unfortunately, I can follow up on that, but um, we'll, we'll note that as a, a desire also. Sorry, what will be the? What will be the licensing policy for Uh Licensing policy. Yep, I, I believe there is both, um, let me see if it's actually in the notes here. I think there is both um, subscription and um, and a perpetual license for that. Let me just check the notes. Yeah, I'll follow up with you offline, but um, yeah, I think, I think there's uh, both, both uh, subscription and perpetual. Okay, uh, then the last thing to close out the uh, session here is the software test lab. So tomorrow morning, all morning in the parallel track, we are going to have a, a test lab, I think, here in the, the side room. So uh, this is going to be a, a beta build of our 2.1 2 release, so 2.0 release last month. This is the uh, Build. There's one on the tech preview today, so if you do want to uh, run through the exercises on your own laptop, you can go to the <coughs> NR software tech preview and install it. Otherwise, we're going to have 30 laptops uh, with the beta. So it's going to be you know, tight. There's not one for everyone. We'll probably have to cycle through a little bit um, or kind of pair up on the machines. But we're going to have a few different scripts, one on object-oriented programming, uh, one on the NHG, Levy NHG web module, uh, one going through some of the workflows that uh, Sumita and Aaron showed up here on 
building uh, distributions, so taking your application, putting it in a, a distribution, a package-based distribution, and then uh, loading that up through the <coughs> package manager. Uh, so we'd love to get feedback on that. As well as um, BI Technologies has a script uh, for Google Class Editor, and then also I'm, I'm gonna have uh, the uh, Viewpoint SVN made on there. I don't have a specific exercise for that, but just as you're going through, uh, you can look at some of the different um, uh, editor integration for um, adding, locking, checking out uh, your project. And then I uh, also wanted to put up for an I week, we will be planning to do another test lab again this year. That will be on Monday if that uh, would potentially influence your travel plans. Okay, great. So uh, afterwards, we're um, finishing a little bit early here, uh, so we do have some time for discussion. So here's um, some of the product owners. Uh, some of them are here, some are not some of the specific areas that uh, they're looking for feedback on Latin on HG specifically. So uh, please come talk to us. If you had some questions that we need to take offline, um, let's be sure and uh, talk so I can get you the right information, point you to the right folks. Um, well, thanks, guys. Thanks for continuing to work with us and giving us feedback on the uh, roadmap. I want to throw in a quick note here. Um, a lot of you, since 2011, have gotten used over the course of a year to saving up your comments and finding me at NI Week, or at, at the CLA Summit, and saying things like, you know, it's really hard to talk to my sales guy because that's outbound from National Instruments. They're used to talking, and they want, you give it directly to me, and I can feed it directly into R&D. And I, you know, I've kind of been a little bit of the face of R&D and with Jeff and a few of the others that have shown up. The presence that R&D has this time, this year, is larger than we've ever done. These are my peers within the R&D organization. These are the folks who are actually going to be in the rooms making decisions. They're technical in G. They know how to speak the language. They know about your use cases. And they care deeply about the product and the use cases you guys are going to be doing. So where sometimes you guys have gotten uh, you know, used to saying, oh, yeah, that's another sales pitch, OK, and you come talk to me afterwards. These really are the people you need to be talking to. And I really encourage you to reach out to them, to you know, use them for their product expertise, and help tune this product. Because every person in here, our livelihoods depend on LabVIEW. And NSG is the future of LabVIEW. And it's incomplete, and it's partial, but it's going in the right direction. And if we can actually get all of you people using it, helping us, and making sure it's tuned in the right direction, We'll have a product that is as good for the next few years as this one has been for the last 40, all right? But it's, it really does require us deciding we're going to take a look at the NXG product and, and really use it. And that, the, the people that are here this week are the ones you want to talk to for that. So I encourage you to take that time. Thanks. Who's got the schedule? I'm not sure when our next session starts up. I think we've got a good, healthy priority. Yeah, so, um, uh, starts on the no, we, we don't have any more slides. We'd just rather have discussions. So, okay, yeah, let's, let's have a good break. Okay, great. We'll take a, a half hour break then. We'll just kind of scoot up the schedule. Yeah, last question. Could we have these telephone numbers? <laughs> I will leave that on a per person basis if they're willing to uh, get that comfortable. At least email. Alright, thanks everyone. Alright, so we're going to be having a break now. Um, we're going to be taking the good picture now, uh, so please uh, come with me just, just to the main entrance. We will take a group picture there and then, uh, yeah, uh, have the break, okay?